a closer look at college student loan debt and the impact it's having on people's lives. Nationwide college graduates owe more than a trillion dollars, and with tuition costs rising faster than inflation, that number is on the rise. Steep monthly payments can haunt young people for years, preventing them from buying homes and cars and living the American dream. We caught up with recent graduates who are straining to pay the price. My student loan debt is like $200,000. 39-year-old Raquel Harper of Hyde Park never dreamed she'd leave grad school nearly a quarter of a million dollars in debt. She's working for a startup financial services company, but doesn't earn enough to pay down her loan or live on her own. I'm staying with my mom. That was, I've cut back expenses a lot. I sold my car. Raquel has an impressive resume, a bachelor's degree from Duke University that left her with about $50,000 in student loans. She racked up another $150,000 in loan debt at the University of Chicago, earning her MBA. I know myself and other classmates, we took on the debt, knowing, hey, we're going to have the jobs, and a lot of times the companies will at least pay half of our debt. And that just hasn't been the case. Raquel is hardly alone. According to the latest figures from the U.S. Department of Education, the average Master of Arts graduate owes about $43,000 in loans. Law school grads, nearly 130,000. And a master's in medicine leaves students an average of $135,000 in debt. Last year, President Obama signed a bill lowering interest rates on student loans, an attempt to ease the pain. It's a burden on their families. It makes it more difficult for them to buy a home. It makes them more difficult, uh, more difficult for them if they want to start a business. Uh, it has a depressive effect on the economy uh, overall. Hey, it's David. Give me a big favor. Give me a call when you get a chance. Thanks. Bye. Chicago mortgage broker David Hochberg noticed student loan debt was preventing a growing number of his clients from qualifying for a mortgage. So he recently started another business called Student Loan Advisors. For a fee, Hochberg helps people take advantage of the two-year-old federal direct consolidation loan program to reduce monthly payments. So what this program does, it enables you to drop it down, you still going to pay the same amount, drop down the payment, extend it out 25 years. 28-year-old Nicole Rohr took advantage of that program. She graduated from Northwestern four years ago with a master's degree and a boatload of student loans. I owe $84,862.66 as of today. With the help of that federal program, Nicole reduced her payments from $1,000 a month to just $375. I'm getting married this year. It's allowed us to be able to pay off some of that, those costs um, and just live our life. Even with lower payments, Nicole estimates it will take nearly 20 years to pay off her loans, money she and her new husband won't be spending to buy their first home. I wish that somebody had sat down with me and explained to me the impact that the, these loans were going to have on my daily life um, prior to my graduating from, with my master's degree. Meanwhile, Raquel is getting a post-grad school lesson in finance the hard way. Her lofty career goals now overshadowed by a mountain of debt and her determination to get out from under it. But my, my student loans are going to get paid off. For me, that would feel, that would be a great accomplishment. Joining us today, Diane Swank, Chief Economist for Mesero Financial. Diane, welcome. Thank you. We saw in the piece these two young ladies, one with debt of $80,000, another with $200,000 in education loan debt. Why is education debt so high? Well, one of the reasons is everyone went into school and we reopened the spigot on federal loans, loan guarantees in the student loan market when it all dried up after the crisis. And so anyone who couldn't get a job went into school and sort of hidden school. I have to admit, I did that during really hard <laughs> economic times as well. But they went into school thinking that, you know, by the time they were done, they'd be able to get a job and service this debt. And unfortunately, the economy is still struggling and they're either underemployed or unemployed and unable to make the payments now. The minute they graduate, of course, that's when we see the debt clock start to tick on them and many people are even deferring it's one area of consumer credit where not only are the default rates rising where everyone else is declining it's rising at a double digit rate and accelerating while the debt loads are still rising as well and there's many people who are deferring graduation because they don't want that clock to start ticking until they have a job so it's really a very vicious cycle we've seen what is this kind of a huge debt load mean to these students? Are we raising a generation of people who will never be able to move out of their parents' basements? Well, you know, we do have over 30, 30%, almost 33% of young adults, 18 to 34, 
still living with their parents right now, which is for us a very high level, unusual. It's even higher in Europe right now because of their economic crisis. But this is a reflection of these are not people that are just slugs and sitting on someone's you know um, couch. They're people who went to college, and many of them went to graduate school, as you noted, as we saw in the earlier piece. And now they have graduate school debt, and that was the path beyond the middle class. That was the path to the upper middle class, to the upper class. And these are the people who are supposed to be able to graduate with jobs and service their debt because they're going to get such good jobs. We've actually seen students try to sue their former law schools, their former veterinary schools, because they couldn't get the jobs to pay off their debt once they graduated and they felt like they were misled by these schools going in. Wow, and you mentioned without jobs and without the ability to pay these off, there's a very high rate of default. What happens? when someone defaults on a loan, who ends up paying for it and how might these students pay in the long run? Well, ultimately, taxpayers pay for it if they're federally guaranteed loans, but the real issue is, unlike all other forms of debt, there's no way of getting this mark off your balance sheet ever. In this extraordinary bad economic time, you may be dooming an entire generation to never being able to qualify for a mortgage or never being able to qualify for a new vehicle loan, and that is the path to, for most families, to wealth. It's going to exacerbate wealth inequalities if we don't deal with it or see a major surge. I'd love to see this cured by a major surge in good quality jobs for these people. I don't anticipate that. I would love to be wrong. But the reality is, for now, it's part of the reason the housing market isn't doing as well. We've got a dearth of first-time buyers. First-time buyers are usually 40 percent of the housing market. They're currently running about 30 percent. And they should be on the rise because of affordability is so high. But these people don't even have access. They've got an overhang of debt. And if they've defaulted, they may never get access to that path to saving and wealth in this country that is the norm. And like, unlike other loans, you can't expunge this debt in bankruptcy. No, you can't. You can't get rid of it. And that's what many people don't realize going into it either. It's not like, um, it's not even like a foreclosure on a house or defaulting on a car loan or defaulting on your credit card. This loan will haunt you for the rest of your life, which is something that, you know, we want people to be able to pay back these loans. We don't want them to default. First of all, so that may be extending and changing the way the interest rates are set, things like that. At one point in time, the interest rates were going to go above the market on these loans if, if Congress hadn't acted, and they did momentarily, which would have caused even more defaults. So there's just so much wrong with it. And there's also the question of, are all the people who took on these loans, should they have been going to college in the first place? Because where are the shortages in the economy? They're in the 18-month trade, skilled trades. And there's been times when people, I've talked to certain um, high schools and community colleges that couldn't people, get people to join into these 18-month training programs, despite the fact 95% hiring rate and some of them getting 70, fifty dollars to $70,000 a year, well above the average college graduate. And it's because we've sort of got this mentality, it's college or nothing where it turns out, where are we missing the people in the economy now? Places where we thought would never exist. Well, I mean, when you look at this, with all of the costs and all of the debt and so few jobs, a lot of parents and students are wondering, is it worth it? to go to college these days? Well, you know, we are seeing a pushback. Um, we're seeing um, many colleges combine up with community colleges to reduce the cost. Um, many colleges are now freezing their tuition or rolling back their tuition or offering an awful lot of financial incentives to get people to go, although they may not be changing their actual ticket price, but they're offering more scholarships. Um, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, I also don't think there's any surprise that one of the few places we saw wages accelerate were where tuition costs were going up professors. And, you know, let's face it, if the college can't return, my daughter just went to college, and when she was applying for the college, they were always saying, you know, this is a wonderful thing, it's worth it. Not one of them said it's going to be worth it in terms of her earnings potential. And, you know, I'm an economist. I believe in following your passion, but also at the end of the day, it's about economics. Is it going to pay off spending fifty or $60,000 a year on an undergraduate degree if you can't really reap the returns of that? And I think, you know, being an educated person is an important thing, but you've got to be able to pay for it at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, we saw the young lady in the, the package ask, uh, you know, said, if I wish I had someone who would have explained this to me. Right. So I knew what I was facing. Uh, is there something wrong with the system that asks a 17-year-old to sign a complex financial document that could saddle them with debt for decades? Well, there's something wrong with the system in general, where we don't have very good financial education in general, but certainly not a 17-year-old looking at, you know, what they think is going to be a big payoff. And even more so, a graduate student, I mean, a lot of this is graduate school debt, where people really did do better in the past, and they aren't doing as well now. And the schools, along with, I mean, the schools have been complicit on it and even um, encouraged some of this. And I think there's responsibility there. But let's face it, the program itself is broken. And we need to fix the program, and we also need to fix the education associated with the program before you get in it. So there's an education you need and financial education before you go get an education. It is really complicated. Uh, 
quick tips for parents who might be sending a child to school. Well, you know, one of the things I have been seeing is that schools are pairing up with community colleges, even graduate schools, very high-ranking ones in this area have paired up with community colleges to reduce the cost of the overall tuition bill and still get that prestigious degree. And what I've been seeing is a lot of, not only is there a lot more money available for financial aid, but not as loans, but as scholarships, go for that first. The other issue is there's a lot more um, people taking two years in a community college and then shifting into a more prestigious college to mitigate the cost. I am amazed at the awareness in my daughter's cohort, who she's in college now, a lot of them said, I don't want to graduate in debt. They were terrified of it. Wow. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Diane Swank, we thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.